Welcome back to Kentucky Route Zero. We're just floating down from the Redvansky Institute. Let's see what we're gonna hit next. Look at those easels and tables on the beach over there. They call it an open air gallery, or probably something more upscale like El Fresco Galleria. They say it's a popular design in foreign cities like Paris and New York. That may be true. The appeal is clear enough, I guess. Anyone can wander in and out. There aren't any walls or doors. There's no roof either. Just a kind of thin cloth membrane. Not quite a sheet or a tarp, but more like a drape of rolled out spider web, looking like it might bunch up and dissolve if it ever got rained on. No concern down here for rain. Everybody thinks they're inside just because they can't see the sky. But it's a microclimate down here, and it surely does rain. Right now, they're exhibiting some intimate photographs of small town life. There's one of a small girl playing in a puddle. She's got her back to the camera and she's fussing with something, looking at her hands. Maybe she's stuffing a message in a bottle, or folding a paper boat. Reviews have been good. It's a popular show, probably because of its relevance. The town depicted in these photos was very recently flattened to make way for a big museum project. Oh, that place. The people that they bought up and offered them to, well, offered <laughs> for them to live at the museum. I'm not sure how much of a choice they had in the matter. Ezra helped Kate forage for mushrooms. Well, this is new. I've, I've never seen this before. Just a different way of presenting an option, I guess, or, or what? Um, either Kate gently rolls a fallen branch and plucks something white from the underside, she holds it up for Ezra to examine, or something that looks totally unrelated. She lit a second cigarette with the embers of the first one. She trembled, sweating a little under a heavy coat. It was warmer near the doors, but she was following directions. No smoking within 25 feet of hospital entrance. So she stood by a hot dog cart parked to the edge of the sidewalk. Oh, that's all of that one, so it stays and then I can still do the other one? Interesting. So yeah, hold something up for Ezra to examine. Plurisabella Plura Porrigans. The common name is Angel Wings. Isn't that pleasant? They have a delicate, springy texture, and they're tasty, like sweet moss. Would you like a bite? Okay. Ezra takes a small bite and ruminates. What do you think? It does taste like moss. Personally, I like to be able to tell where my food came from by flavor alone. I like to taste my surroundings, I mean. It keeps me connected to the, the whole thing. My mushroom hunting mentor told me, it's useless to pretend to know mushrooms. They escape your erudition. The more you know them, the less sure you feel about identifying them. She taps the cover of the small red book she's carrying. That's why I always bring my favorite guidebook. Kate points to a small mushroom growing in the dirt. Oh, here's an important one to recognize, though. Look. 
See the sort of greenish pallor of the cap? Amanita phylloidus. That's Greek. Amanita means mushroom, and phylloidus means... Um, never mind. <laughs> I think I can guess what phylloidus means. Can you eat it? Only once. It's deadly poisonous. Death cap. That's the common name. It's killed a lot of people, this little mushroom. Including a few Roman emperors. It's a revolutionary. Even the Buddha died from eating a mushroom when he was very old. That's just what they do. Clear away old things, make room for new things. Pretty important, right? I've always thought they deserved a little more respect. Would you like to help me look for a few more? I have a sort of shopping list. Great, look for... Uh, actually, just grab any mushrooms that catch your eye and throw them in this bag. Let me know when you're done and we'll see what you've got. Have fun! That's the second rule of mushroom hunting. The first rule is ask Kate before eating anything, okay? Whoa, multiple options again. So I guess this was always playing as Ezra and this was as Kate? I wonder, is that what Kate was thinking of? Talking about the uh, smoking and no smoking near the entrance and being outside in the cold and all that. Kate digs in a bare patch of dirt. It's a bit muddy from flooding or the general dampness of the caves. She finds two promising specimens, a spotted brown cap and a dense bundle of dark ridges. Oh, and now we're back to this. The hot dog vendor tried to strike up a conversation with some immediately too personal questions. She decided to give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he was, uh, maybe he considered it part of his job. She thought to offer his customers some kind of counsel. Maybe it was to salve his guilty conscience for selling junk food outside a hospital. <laughs> Kate inspects the spotted brown cap. The bottom of the cap is covered in tiny, tooth-like protrusions. Kate plucks the mushroom from the dirt and puts it in her bag. Kate kneels in the grass. She parts the grass with her garden knife, studiously combing the ground. Had she ever tried any alternative medicines? Acupuncture? Homeopathy? Ayurveda? Magical thinking? She said she'd never heard of any of those things. He fished a stray hot dog out of the pickle jar. There are no mushrooms in the grass. Kate tries to wipe some mud off her boot. Didn't find anything? That's okay. I just found this one. Kate takes the spotted brown cap out of her bag. Okay, this one is called Bitter Hedgehog, and it's on my list. It's great for nausea, which is basically the number one complaint of the pregnant women I treat. Tastes kind of like black pepper. It's okay. I let it dry out so it's really tough, and they just chew on it like bubblegum. So... Uh, maybe I should play Ezra a bit before I go back to this. I'm assuming I could still ask Ezra these questions, even after playing as Ezra for a bit. Ezra investigates a rotting stump. The stump is ringed with overlapping shelves of mushrooms striped brown, blue, gray, white. A caterpillar crawls along one of them. He didn't like to play in the house. It was always too cold. It seemed to store up the cold at night, then slowly discharge it into his bones during the day while the sun bounced feebly off the windows. Would he like to play in the woods behind the house? He didn't have any friends nearby. None of their new neighbors seemed to have children his age. So he played alone in the woods. Alone except for the deer. Ezra inspects the caterpillar. The caterpillar shuffles listlessly across the mushroom, seems to be dragging several of its legs, 
An odd brown-black thread protrudes about two inches out of its head. He saw strange lights in the trees, flickering purple. He kept going. Ezra carefully picks up the caterpillar and puts it in his bag. Ezra closes his eyes and listens to the water and the distant clicking of bats. He tripped on a protruding root and lay for a while in the mud, examining the pale upper branches of a sycamore tree, listening to the soft rumble of a faraway thunderstorm, then louder, closer, and his hair stood on end. And there was the bird. Julian. What do your parents do? For work, I mean. My dad used to sell windows. People were building a lot of new houses, and they needed a lot of windows, but then they stopped building houses. My mom worked at a bakery and a bar. Sometimes she would see the same people in the morning and the evening. The bakery closed, and she doesn't work at the bar anymore, but she still goes there a lot to see her friends. Do you have a family? I left home when I was very young. Not much older than you, actually. I bounced around jobs and shelters and finally found my way down to the Echo River. Never looked back. I've basically been on my own since then. Well, that's not really true. Just about everyone who sets foot aboard the Mucky Mammoth feels like family to me now. I guess if nobody's family, then everybody's family. These are the only trees in this whole cave. Who planted them here? Right, not many trees down here in the dark. I know these are some kind of cypress, and they were definitely planted here deliberately. Uh... By someone who... I guess I don't know much about this place, really. It's supposed to be some kind of memorial? To something? Will would know more. Sorry, it's a mystery. Ezra kicks the dirt. Months later, she came across a book on a homeopathic medicine in a used bookstore and bought it. It's a mystery. <laughs> I'll search for clues. She put out her cigarette, said goodbye to the hot dog vendor, and spent the rest of the afternoon listening to doctors and trying to understand the world as they did, as a list of discreet injuries to be mended. It's interesting this play back and forth between these two different sides. Between Kate and Ezra. I am curious what this is a monument for. What is this creepy noise I'm hearing now? Do you hear it? To me, it sounds like distant screaming. Christ. Oh, wait. There's something moving here. Is that what I'm hearing? What is that? I see three cats. Another kitty cat. Oh, tons of kitty cats. Is that a floating cat island or something? Or cat boat? I don't know what it is. There's so many. One, two, three, four... 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, there's dozens. Haven't seen a single human. Just 
some old, tattered cat boat. It's mesmerizing. I want to watch her go and just see if anything happens. That was so cool. Alright, let's see. Ezra investigates a cypress tree. The tree smells spicy, oily. Ezra inspects the bark. A message is carved in the bark. Ozzy, or Ozy Y. Ezra examines a large stone monument. The monument is covered with lichen and painted text. Read the text. Rock graffiti. X plus O forever. Huh. Ezra inspects the contents of his pockets. And then Kate, alright, what have you got? That stone face monument has X plus O forever painted on it. Interesting. What do you think that means? Hug and kiss forever? Or they could be initials. Xavier and Olivia forever. Xerxes and Oliver. What do you think that monument is for? I'm not sure anyone remembers. Somebody carved Ozzy in that tree over there. Oh. Huh. What do you think that means? It's part of somebody's name. Or it's short for something. Observe zero yaks. <laughs> Look at the word zero too. It's just like the zero. Like going to the zero. Where it's like, it's kind of subtle, but it's not quite staying still. It's got like clouds passing through it. It's staticky. Old Zebra Yard. Ornery Zoologist Yacht. I don't know what that means. Yeah, it was a stretch. Well, Ezra, can't say I know what that all adds up to. Like I said, I wish Will were here. He'd have some local history for us. We can ask him back on the boat. Kate and Ezra look up at an old battleship drifting by. Oh, there it is. The Iron Pariah. Don't worry, it's just passing by. Oh, that was... the cat ship? The Iron Pariah? It's a battleship. <laughs> what do you think of it? Oh, we got some stuff up here for Ezra. Um, Ezra's parents shook him awake. They seemed alarmed, but not immediately concerned. They led him back to the house, past the house, into the car. Is it full of ghosts? Oh, I don't know. Probably. I mean, no, definitely not. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? No. I've never met a young kid who really believed in ghosts. Lots of older people do, though. I wonder why that is. Someone told me she got close to it by accident and heard a strange wailing sound. We just heard a wailing sound. She was a passenger on the Mammoth. She said she'd been out fishing on a rowboat 
and got swept up by a current near the cluttered place. Before she knew it, the iron pariah was upon her, unimaginably massive, up close but eerily silent. The only sounds she said were the lapping of the lake water against its iron hull, and a faint sort of... well, she said a chorus of mews. I'll be damned if I know what that sounds like. Never gotten close enough to the ship myself. I've heard it was in the Civil War. I guess they had boats full of soldiers and supplies going up and down the Ohio, Ohio River. And they fought on the river, like boat to boat, with cannons or something, I guess. Machine guns? I'm no military historian, as you can probably tell. Anyway, I guess this one just got lost and somehow ended up all the way down here. Maybe it slipped into a cave up north. They're all connected underground. There's another version of the story where it didn't get lost. It was full of deserters. They came down here to hide. Maybe that's why it's a pariah. More mysteries. They do pile up over time, as people forget the details. Thanks for taking me mushroom picking. Let's go back over here. Dad said they were going to stay at the bus station for a while, the one with the little arcade, with the car game he liked. Dad watched him closely in the rearview mirror, expecting Ezra to be excited or confused or scared, but he didn't feel anything. He hardly seemed to hear. The bus stop. The bus stop. Isn't that where Ezra returned to the bus stop and her whole family was gone. In fact, he felt like he was observing the family car from a distance, from far above, from the clouds. Mushroom hunting? You can pick apples because they're right out there in the open. Mushrooms hide. You have to hunt for them. Time to go? Hold on. Is there something I can do? No, it seems I can't move. Okay, let's go. Oh, look at all this trash floating here at the bottom. See that rough circle of rocky protrusions near the shore? It's more intricate than it looks. More than two-thirds of it is actually underwater. I haven't seen it myself, but listen to this. It's man-made, and the rocks weren't placed according to their size. So what's visible is more or less uniformly random selection of the overall shape. It looks like it might be a spiral, all told, or maybe some kind of meditative labyrinth. At the head of it is a petrified oak stump. That was moved here from above ground, of course, decades ago. That's where the ceremony took place. The Lock Lux were married here. Many frail-tongued observers said they should just go with Lock or Luck, or split the difference with Look, or even Lick, or really anything else, but it was never going to happen. <laughs> I get to choose how they met. You know what I think the most romantic thing is, probably? Billy Luck and W.H. Lock met in line at the DMV. Their driver's license photographs were mixed up by the clerk, a mistake they discovered immediately but never corrected. Their engagement was welcome news for the family businesses, who had been looking for some opportunity to merge interests. They were the locks of Luck Large Animal Storage and the Lux of the Luck Family Nut Company. Surely someone in some branch of those two great trees had elephant husbandry on the brain. This is all speculation. The ceremony itself was humble and perfunctory. It must have somehow involved these rocks. Maybe they walked around them in a spiral, like a symbol of their ever-tightening bond. And it must have also involved that petrified stump. Neither family is particularly religious, but rumors persist that the officiant wore a robe.
I seriously do want to replay this and just see what the other side of this is. I feel like there's so much of this, of, of the story. Like, I feel like I'm missing basically half the story. Not in like a bad way, but just in a I really want to replay it way. So either Shannon helped me fix up a mushroom stew in the kitchen. So, yeah, I've gathered that the, the me here is Kate, since you're the pilot. Or Shannon and her friends set out in the dinghy to deliver a package at the telephone exchange. Okay, I'm going to go with Shannon help me fix up a mushroom stew in the kitchen. And you know why? I'll tell you why. In just a second, after I've made sure the game's saved. How we doing? Save just now. Okay, cool. I figured. Yeah, so let's, well, here, I'll leave it going so we get some nice background sound and some cool stuff to look at. What's Shannon doing with the TV? Oh, they're watching some videos on the TV. That's right, there was a video room on board. A lot of tapes by the looks of it. So the reason I picked Shannon helping Kate is because ever since I first saw Kate, even though I didn't know much about them, although at this point I know a bit more about them, but ever since I first saw them, I thought they just seemed really cool and I kind of want to see Shannon just hang out with Kate and maybe for them to get together or something. I don't know, it sounds nice. They just seem like they'd make a cool couple. All right, well, before I continue here, I think I want to end off the episode here, but first I want to talk about some kind of interesting thematic stuff that I've been thinking about when it comes to Kentucky Route Zero. Um, it describes itself, like if you look at a synopsis for the game or the Steam store description or something like that, the game describes itself as um, magical realism, and I'm not exactly 100% sure what that means, but I think this that actually might mean what I've been noticing thematically, which is that even though a lot of very strange and sort of alien and surreal stuff keeps happening, I mean, we have Julian, the gigantic bird that we fly on, and we've got these, like, Xanadu, uh, everything being inside of some strange simulation, and we have these crystalline figures that look like they came out of Xanadu, but they're not in Xanadu, I don't think. There's all this, like, really strange kind of sci-fi stuff and fantasy stuff, but at the same time, it's such a down-to-earth kind of um, world, despite the huge bird and Xanadu and the strangers and everything. I mean, let's just take the strangers, for example. They look like they're computer crystalline projection things. However, you visit there and what are they doing? They're just like general people trying to work off debt. People in a really shitty situation. And everywhere you go, it's just, it's the same sort of thing. It's, you're presented with this fantastical sort of stuff, but at the same time, the people you're meeting are just like, you know, a traveling musician trying to skate by, and like everybody's in, in debt or just barely scraping by, Shannon's about to lose their shop, and you know, Conway's pretty well screwed at this point, it looks like. Everybody's just kind of trying to make it, and not doing all that great. So it's like a really grim and pretty depressing world, to be honest. Inside of all this fantastical fantasy and sort of sci-fi stuff, maybe that's exactly what magical realism is. It probably is. Sounds like it. But yeah, it's just an interesting thing I noticed. No matter how fantastical some things seem, it always comes down to just people trying to make it and trying to live their life. It's interesting. I, I like it. I think it grounds the series. Well, I hope you've enjoyed so far. And when we return, we're gonna help Kate make soup, was it? Mushroom stew or something like that? And perhaps we can work a little bit closer to having Shannon and Kate get married at the strange rock formation with the tree stump. 